Before we jump into today's topic, a quick disclaimer. The stories and data we share come from the states that we practice in and the experiences that we've personally had, which can differ greatly across our country and certainly the globe. This is not a professional advice show. So let's get comfy and talk about death. Welcome to Mort Mike, a down-to-earth discussion on death and dying. I'm Jem. And I'm Red. And this week, we're your masters of morbid mixtures. <laughs> After our innards laid bare last week in Jem's basic how-to on autopsies, we're following up today on what to do with all of those organs. I'm going to give you a quick walkthrough on the embalming process. I would love to go into all of the extensive history of embalming, but since it dates back all the way to ancient Egyptian times, it's honestly an episode on its own, and we'll definitely revisit it someday. Absolutely. After we get our whole autopsy done, just like I taught you two weeks ago, then the body goes to Red, a funeral director, and that's when the embalming starts. There are so many fascinating ways to embalm and types of cases that an embalmer will come face to face with, but for today's purposes, I'm keeping it super simple with a best case scenario body and then an autopsy embalming. So what exactly does a best case scenario body mean? In the respect for an embalmer, it means a freshly dead person, preferably somebody who's had a very short hospital stay, wasn't on a bunch of different medications, didn't have any trauma like accidents or injuries or major surgeries, and had limited disease and symptoms. Things like edema can weaken your embalming fluid. Uh, diabetics have restricted blood flow to their extremities. And atherosclerosis causes plaque buildup inside of the arteries, which weakens the flow that you get to the different parts of the body. So now that we have this perfect body, what exactly is the goal and the purpose of embalming? The purpose of embalming is threefold. Preservation, sanitation, and the optimal presentation of the disease through chemical means. So you got your three Asians. <laughs> <laughs> and a side note for those who might not know, embalming is not something that comes with a guarantee or a warranty. It's not an exact science, so just because somebody was embalmed doesn't mean that they'll be preserved for a week, a month, years to come. There's so many different variables, uh, not only in somebody who's passed away and their chemistry, but also with the chemicals that you're using. I mean, it's not like you're baking a cake where it's exact, I need this much salt, I need this much sugar. It's kind of wacky. <laughs> mm -hmm. So no one's going to be calling you about your extended warranty on your embalming. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> So at our disposal, we have many tricks and treats to get the job done. So in my first embalming kit, TM, uh, first and <laughs> foremost, we need embalming fluid. And there's many different classes of embalming fluids. So to start off, you'll obviously need your arterial fluid. And arterial fluid is what most people think of when they think embalming fluid. It's formaldehyde, it's glutaraldehyde. So the difference between the two is that glutaraldehyde is a liquid, and formaldehyde is a gas that's bound to water. So the water is the vehicle that gets the formaldehyde in. And the really, really big difference between the two that a lot of people look to is that glutaraldehyde hasn't been found to be a carcinogen that causes cancer, where formaldehyde actually has been in many studies. And that's a very recent thing, actually. Formaldehyde it was a carcinogen. I think it was made official maybe two or three years ago. Yeah, you're right. They had been doing a lot of long-term studies on that, and it is just a recent thing, so... Definitely something to watch out for. Um, we were lucky that in, in our embalming class, they kind of gave us a heads up to look out for, for that. So if you're in a firm that's still using formaldehyde, definitely try to see if you can get some glutaraldehyde instead. Mm -hmm. Or make sure your ventilation system is up to date. Which a lot don't seem to be. <laughs> so a lot of people like to debate the effectiveness between glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde, saying that glutaraldehyde doesn't form tissues the same um, and, and other things. But honestly, it just has different telltale signs instead of formaldehyde, where obviously formaldehyde creates um, a rock hard body, air quotes there. Glutaraldehyde can be a little more flexible in the tissues. 
but you just have to look for color changes and some other things we'll talk about along the way. Personally, if it's not already obvious, I like glutaraldehyde. I think I've only ever embalmed using formaldehyde. We actually use formaldehyde in the hospital as well to preserve specimens. Oh yeah, specimen jars and stuff. Yeah, but glutaraldehyde definitely sounds very interesting. I've never used it before. Yeah, definitely. When you spill cavity fluid and you have to evacuate the room, <laughs> it's definitely better to have glutaraldehyde. Not ideal. <laughs> right. So the other chemicals that we're going to have at our disposal are going to be uh, co-injection fluids. These are things that assist with the distribution of the fluid, um, the alter arterial fluid. There's moisturizers or humectants that help to keep people, uh, well, moist. It's lotion for your insides. And some other fluids that actually help uh, adjust the condition of water. So if there's a hardness in the water, extra minerals, those can affect the product of embalming. So it's definitely good to offset that. We also have cosmetic dyes. And cosmetics aren't just for your outsides. They can be for your insides too. The best skin tone comes from the inside first, is what I always like to say. So that is that why the formaldehyde in the funeral home is usually pink? Uh, yeah. So a lot of different arterial fluids actually have dyes in them already, but if you have somebody that has a specific case like jaundice or other things where they're already very pallid or of a, of a different color, it's always good to have a little extra boost of dye just to help that pink show through. Yeah, for those of you who have never seen it before, the formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde chemicals used in the embalming room oftentimes look like Pepto-Bismol kind of pink. It's really quite fun, I think. Definitely. Yeah, like uh, like uh, pinks, oranges. I've even seen for to offset like jaundice, they have like a purpley dye mm -hmm. in some. So uh, a lot of different fun colors. <laughs> so how do we exactly measure the potency of these fluids? There's something called an index on all of these arterial fluids. And what that is uh, is a magic number we learned about in school and there's an equation basically that helps you decide how much of a fluid and how much index you need for somebody and that usually goes out the window as soon as you go <laughs> into um, the field and so it, it gets down to the point of okay do I need a low index for somebody who is dehydrated and this would like really dry their skin out so we'll use something lower index or something up to a high index for somebody who's decomposed and really needs to get hit hard with a fluid. And of course we need something to put all of these in. We need our embalming machine and a lot of you probably are familiar with what looks like uh, that large cylindrical tube that's going to be your Porto boy. <laughs> it's very, very fun name, very old name. Um, but then you can get to the newer stuff, which a lot of people don't see. It's not as uh, easy to identify uh, if you don't know what it is. It's a giant cube and it's made by Dodge and you take this little top off and fill it and you don't even really see the fluid unless you open it up. Uh, I personally like the Porta Boys or any of those glass cylinders. I think they look way cooler, um, mm -hmm. but that's just a personal preference. So we have our fluid mixed. We figured that out. So now we need all of the instruments to be able to assist us. And uh, just a reminder, something that my embalming teacher would want me to let all of you know, they are instruments. They are not tools. A tool is a hammer and things like that. Instruments are things that are used in cases of like medical sciences and things. I would agree. I would say we use medical instruments instruments, not uh, tools. <laughs> right, exactly. So we'll need our scalpel, we'll need our scissors, and our C and S-curve needles. Those are our sharps. We have our hemostats, which are little ridged. Um, how, would you, how would you describe a hemostat? It's like... They're like, like scissors, so they can clamp onto things, but there's no blades. Instead of the blades, there's like a serrated, like flat surface, kind of like pliers. It's like if scissors and pliers had a baby. Yeah, and it's like a, it has a locking mechanism on it. So once you yeah. grab something, it'll stay in place with this little locking mechanism. Um, similar to that, we have our forceps as well as angular forceps, one looking like a giant pair of tweezers and the other being like a half-hooked giant pair of tweezers, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> with a 45-degree bend in them. Uh, we have our aneurysm hook, which is similar looking to basically a toothbrush with a little hook at the end of it. Or somebody that is familiar with crocheting might be able to relate their crochet hooks to it. We have our arterial tube and our trocar. And for those who don't know what a trocar is, it's the most magical part of the embalming. Um, it is a two foot hollow needle, essentially. Then we'll find out what that's for later. A big spiky stick. <laughs> I love much. a trocar. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so our stage has been set. 
All of our instruments are in place. Our tank is full of forbidden Kool-Aid. So let's <laughs> crack open that body bag. Now keep in mind, this is my method. No one way is right. Everyone's going to have their own flavor to embalming. Typically, if I'm working pretty hard, the body is pretty simple. I can do an embalming in about 45 minutes to an hour. Obviously, if you're just in mort school, it can take you like six hours to embalm a body with a team of six people. So don't feel bad uh, while you're learning. It does take quite a bit of time and not everybody is going to give you that easy 45 minute embalming. And I'm assuming this would also be like our perfect body scenario. It wouldn't be anyone with any like um, arterial plaque or any sort of autopsy done to them, right? Exactly correct. So we start similarly to your examination by doing an external ocular pat down. Um, so <laughs> we do the undressing, we document personal effects. So we do have to make sure all of the medical devices are removed, uh, things like ports for people that had cancer that are having chemo, uh, anything that's hanging off like needles that are still in somebody IVs, those things get discarded. And this is a good time to break rigor. Um, obviously everyone's pretty familiar with what rigor mortis is, and so we need to try to break that right away. It, uh, aids with the flow of fluids and also allows us to get positioning correct. I had this beaten into me when I was first, uh, first greenhorn on the job as an embalmer. Um, positioning is very important. You want to make sure that essentially somebody is exactly as they should be once they're finished embalming before you start embalming, because as soon as they start to firm up, they should be in the position that they're meant to be in. Yeah. So once the embalming takes place, they're pretty hard to move afterwards is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's hard to tell um, how somebody's got to react uh, to the fluids. They could basically rock. Like I had mentioned that earlier, we call it rocking a body. Um, mm. So it makes it hard to dress somebody or position them properly afterwards if you embalmed them with their arms down uh, as opposed to having their like hands over their tummy in the natural position. So going back for a second, how do you break rigor? So breaking rigor is uh, traumatic <laughs> if you've never <laughs> done it before. Um, so usually you take your pivot points, places like elbows, shoulders, and you essentially work them out. So I rotate someone's arm in their shoulder socket try to get that kind of pulled out you'll have a little resistance once you start to break the rigor you can feel the muscles pulling against you and you'll even see them kind of like flexing um, underneath somebody's skin but you just push past that and then they immediately relax um, the hardest part to break rigor to me is fingers mm. because you can break someone's finger pretty easily i unfortunately have not done it myself um, but i've known of other people that have had that bad experience yeah, especially if they're an older person. But yep, you do have to use a little bit of force to break that rigor, and it is a little intimidating when you first start doing it. Absolutely, it really is. It takes it takes some time. Uh, I I finally, after about two years, felt comfortable breaking rigor pretty much everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have our body position how we want them to, the first thing I like to do is find vessels. So we need to have a point of entry for our fluid and a point of exit for our fluid, and that is easiestly done on the right side of the body where you make an incision right about where that collarbone is, the clavicle, just inferior to the bone. So just right below the bone. You can even palpate on yourself right now with your fingers where there's that little dip underneath your collarbone. And I like to go right there, um, not too close to the center of the chest because you want to be able to hide that incision. While I'm doing this, I make sure the heads drop back. It really helps you uh, find the vessel once you start digging. So after you make the incision, you're looking for the arterial bundle which essentially is a noodle, um, <laughs> but it's a really hard noodle to find. So you start to dig underneath uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which if you tilt your head to the side, you can feel it running from your clavicle all the way up to like basically the back of your ear. And so we dig underneath that, find the little bundle that has the arterial noodle and then the jugular vein. They're all kind of right in that same bundle. So what I do is insert the uh, angular forceps into the jugular, and that's for drainage. We want to make sure we have an exit point for all the fluid we're about to push into somebody. And essentially, when you insert those forceps, it goes down um, through the jugular into the heart. So you're able to pull out clots. Red's favorite clots. <laughs> yeah, my favorite. <laughs> It's a necessary evil. <laughs> <laughs> so we place the arterial tube into the artery and we can hook up the tube from our embalming machine to it. 
And this is where you would adjust what's called pressure and flow. You want to make sure you have the appropriate pressure and flow of the fluid going into the body. Um, because if you have too much pressure, you can do something horrible, like blow someone's eyes out of their face. Oh <laughs> That's, my gosh. <laughs> that sounds I didn't know like that I'm was making possible. <laughs> it, up. I, it sounds like I'm making it up, but it's totally a thing. It's not like, uh, <laughs> like a movie where it just goes and just goes right out or anything, but they start to inflate out of the oh eye, uh, eye socket and can come out if you're not paying attention. Wow. Yeah. To uh, Yet again, just very a traumatizing experience if you're doing mm. it wrong. <laughs> No, that makes sense. There's a lot of little arteries in your eyeballs, guys. So that totally makes sense why they would do that. Yeah. So while I have somebody injecting, um, and this is yet again, they will not teach you to do this in mortuary science school. This is my quick, fast, and in a hurry embalming. I'll start to set features while the clock is ticking. Because like I said, as you're embalming somebody, they do start to firm up our um, the veins descend, things like that. So I'll set features, which starts with the eyes. Uh, I will break any rigor in the eyes, insert our fancy schmancy eye caps that we talked about before, <laughs> our little spiked contact lenses. And uh, we use what's called the two-thirds rule. You want two-thirds of the upper lid to be um, the majority, and the lower lid only takes up one-third. And then I take a, a, check, a second to just dry the eyelashes off. I always make sure that they're dry because even something as simple as uh, the follicles in your eyelashes, if they're all stuck together, they'll actually embalm and freeze that way. So if they're all nice and spread apart, hmm. uh, you won't have that like uh, clumping. Uh, in the eyelashes once someone's embalmed. Then I go down to the mouth closure. There's a few different ways to close a mouth. There are suture or you can use a needle injector. And I feel very strongly about this. Um, I do not like needle injectors. Essentially what a needle injector is, it's a little spike with a wire coming off of it. And you use this hammer, essentially. It's not a hammer, but like a handheld press. I always thought it looked like an ear piercing gun. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a pretty close uh, approximation to that. So you you put the little spike in the needle injector and you basically punch it into somebody's uh, gums where the bone is, and then you would just wire tied together. Um, personally, I do not like how the outcome is. I feel like I can't control the um, closure of the mouth very well. And sometimes the spikes pop out and the wires break. And I just, I rather just have more control with doing a cord suture instead. Mm -hmm. So you can either take the suture and go through the skin of where the lip meets the lower teeth. The frenulum. The frenulum. <laughs> uh, you can also go around the mandible, uh, which you basically insert around the entirety of the bone. And once you've completed that, you would then insert the needle up through the nose, through the septum, and back down, uh, and then tie it all together. So hopefully you have caught enough of the... What's it called? It's not bone. It's not skin. It's half Cartilage. Between. Cartilage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like that song. <laughs> Our next record label hit. It's not bone. It's not skin. It's cartilage. It's cartilage. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully by doing this you've caught enough cartilage that you're able to have a very very solid suture and you just make a little tie knot it and you're good to go at this time i always like to reposition somebody like i said positioning is very important and so i take always a second to just quick fast make sure everybody's where they need to be so this is about where the halftime of an embalming is, and this is where we start to add massage to our list of things to do. So I'll use some really industrial strength soap, and massage does a lot of different things for us. So it's a mechanical assistance, essentially. Uh, while the fluid is pushing through the arteries and out the jugular, you can use the massage itself as a mechanical means to push blood towards the heart. So you would obviously start from an extremity like the foot and then massage using the soap uh, up towards the heart, helping to push any blood out that's in vessels that are really hard to get to. And of course, this is where we do our favorite part of pulling clots out with the angular forceps. <laughs> so ten, uh, after you do massage, that tends to loosen up a lot of things. And this is where you'll get, ugh, if you like it, your best clots. These would be your post-mortem clots. So really huge, gelatinous, jelly, good old boys. <laughs> This is also a really optimal time to be washing someone's hair, uh, trimming their nails, trimming beards, ear hair, all those little places uh, that we often don't get to take care of when we age. I have a question about this, actually. Sure. 
In funeral directing school, they told us that we should always ask about trimming facial hair, and this includes older women. Because of menopause, a lot of older women tend to grow facial hair when they're older. And they told us that we should ask families about that. Do you generally ask families about that? Yeah, so absolutely. It's super important. There's a story I'll share with you guys, actually, that links back to this that my embalming teacher had mentioned to us. And she had gone ahead and shaved a lady uh, without asking for permission. And once the family came in, they were just appalled. They were freaking out because they, <laughs> they had shaved her mole that had a few little hairs coming out of it. And that was her special mole. And it was a... <laughs> <laughs> joke with the family and they were just so oh, sad no. that it was gone all oh, the hairs were gone special mole yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's always good to ask for permission regardless of gender or presentation mm, absolutely so at this time how do we know that it's working how do we know that we're getting the distribution of all this fluid into the various vessels we look for a few different things uh, color change is one of the easiest ones to see you'll obviously see where all of the blood has sunk to the bottom or the back of somebody that will start to change you'll get the nice pink in the superficial epidermis you'll also start to see uh, the distension of vessels so you know when somebody's angry and that little vein pops out on their temple uh, basically like that but all over the body in various different places you'll get that firming or like a rubberiness when you're running your fingers across somebody obviously drainage if you're getting a lot of blood flow out of the jugular you know that you have a nice completed circuit and the last would be purge um, if somebody some Sometimes the fluid can build up inside of somebody, causing pressure on the stomach uh, or any other organ, and then purge can happen because of that. So you definitely know you're getting some type of um, distribution if that's happening. So now, dun da da da, it is trocar time. We trocar finally time. get to talk about this crazy little spear that we use. So we got to get that goo out. All of the things that I had mentioned up to this point, that's just using the arteries and veins to get out all of the blood that's inside of somebody and replacing it with a fluid. But that doesn't connect to your stomach. Your stomach fluid isn't going to come out through your jugular. So we need to get everything that's in those organs out and by very forcible means. So what you'll do is you'll take this spear that's attached to an aspirator, which is basically just using water to create a vacuum. And you'll insert the trocar two inches to the right and two inches up from the belly button. That's a really good vantage point to be able to reach to all of the different organs that need to be sucked. Um, and essentially you just stab it in and you start stabbing into your key organs trying to uh, get all the goo out and it goes straight into the drain. It is awful to see if you don't know that it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, but very, very necessary because so you don't open up the body and take all the organs out and embalm them individually, right? Yeah, exactly. That would only be the case once we get to an autopsy embalming. But yeah, yeah, it's the least invasive way to be able to remove all of those various fluids and things from somebody without opening them up. And it's honestly really effective because of that aspiration, you're taking everything out. So do you put anything back in afterwards? Yeah, we do actually. So you always want to back yourself up with a little bit of uh, chemical activity. We would then place what's called cavity fluid back into uh, the various cavities that we just aspirated. So cavity fluid is uh, basically like taking arterial fluid and timesing it by 10. It is very, very potent. Like I mentioned earlier, if you spill cavity fluid that's formaldehyde base, you will immediately start to tear up. The fumes are just so hard to be around. You immediately have to start flushing it with water. Otherwise, like you start basically choking on it. It's bad, but it yeah. works well at what it does. Yeah, you need that heavy hitting stuff for all that poop that's in there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you have to counteract it somehow. So now that we've pretty much fully embalmed and chemically treated our body, we need to start suturing them up. So you take our S-curve needle, which is exactly what it looks like. It's shaped like an S, and you stitch up all the incisions, uh, any place that you've put trocars in, uh, the aspiration hole, things like that. If people have like trachs or other medical things, you can then suture at this time too. They also have what's called trocar buttons, uh, which are like little screws, little plastic screws that you can screw into place where these holes are made by trocars. You'd glue the eyes, the mouth, over the incisions, you place glue and cover them with cotton. That way nothing leaks out. I like to pack people's noses too with cotton. Uh, you just place a big strip of cotton down into someone's uh, nasal cavity. It helps with any future purge if that is the case. 
and not all people use this and not all people need it but we have our glorious av plug our anal vaginal plug if anybody just can't stop pooping we have this Ugh. option <laughs> i hate i always hated this part <laughs> yeah i know it's it's pretty wild i would rather do an av plug than try to stuff someone full of cotton with forceps but an av plug is essentially a giant butt plug <laughs> excuse our french yeah it's not <laughs> it, it, we're not trying to cover it up with any it is what it is here it is what it is uh you can put powders in it that help with um any types of leakage and you basically just twist it up in there and and uh cork it as it were not pleasant not pleasant so our final wrap up the last few finishing touches we like to dry people off i do one more final reposition uh, we can use weights to keep people's hands down if they're kind of floating um, like if they embalm too quickly uh, you can use head blocks that can uh, elevate different parts um, everybody's obviously different um, and grew differently so everybody usually needs their own special positioning we also have the option of feature building at this point. If someone became very, very um, emaciated towards the ends of their life, they have their temples all sunken in, you can use feature builder and basically with a syringe, put this artificial Botox in someone's face and fill out those spots to give them a few extra years back on their life. I also put cream on hands and face, so basically a moisturizer in case they dry out a little more. And then you respectfully cover them and finish up your embalming report. Embalming import is super important because you never know if you're going to have to come back to it or if somebody else is going to try to figure out what you did or need to add to something it's good to take really good notes so now we know the basics let's make it a little bit harder the final boss of an embalming is its autopsy counterpart <laughs> There's a lot of similar steps, but a whole lot more time consuming. It takes about two and a half to three hours, especially if you're doing it by yourself. It could even take longer, depending. Um, and this is assuming that the case that we're working on is both a cranial and an abdominal uh, autopsy, where all of those cavities were opened for examination. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely going to need stronger fluids, and really, you want to work with two people. You're going to start with opening up this pit. We like to undo all of the sutures that uh, medical examiners and their autopsy techs have put in. They do a quick whip stitch. Um, it's not meant to do anything except for hold the flaps together uh, for the short term. Mm -hmm. And we'll also open up the cranium too. So we'll take out the organ bag because after they've examined all of the organs, they place it into a big medical plastic bag and tie it off. So we take that out. Um, opening that up, we'll snip at the organs because there's a, a lot of gas buildup that can happen, especially in the intestines. And you want to make sure that the fluid that you're about to add penetrates as deep as possible. So we take scissors or even a scalpel if you're feeling froggy and make little incisions and snips in them. So that way all the fluid can really get in there. So it's best to do this at the beginning because you want to make sure that it's embalming the entire time that you are embalming the body. So it gives two to three hours to the organs to really absorb that fluid. But as for the calvarium which is that little uh the hat for your brain <laughs> your skull cap yeah there we go i think i like hat for your brain <laughs> so you have the calvarium and you also have the uh rib cage bones which as Jem had mentioned you have to cut out to get to all of the good bits underneath there's a few different ways that you can embalm these um you can stick them right into the bag with the organs and tie it off you can wrap them in cotton and pour fluids over them and let that sit for a while i even had one embalmer friend he would take the calvarium and just stick it right in the embalming tank. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, he got in a lot of trouble for that because there kept get meat chunks kept getting in and uh, clogging yep, that's it. That's not ideal, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it worked great for the actual evolving of the calvarium, but nothing else. <laughs> so obviously, when you disrupt somebody's vas uh, vasculature, you are going to have more than just the one incision point. So it's what we call a six-point injection. Um, now that all of the organs are out of the way, you're able to find the carotids up by the neck, femorals down low where their legs are. Those are pretty easy to find. Usually medical examiners try to leave those out for us. They know that we're looking for them. And then we go for the axillary arteries for the arms. So um, there's a lot more dissection for this. And they're also really small and really easy to miss. I still have a hard time finding these vessels, to be honest. Yeah, they're definitely a bit smaller than the carotids and the femorals. Absolutely. Now, this is something that I got a bone to pick with you, Jim. Don't <laughs> don't you cut my arteries. I know. This is like the biggest thing. This is like the funeral director versus medical examiner showdown. It's <laughs> right. like 
<laughs> yeah, I, autopsy techs, whenever I teach or train autopsy techs or residents, I'm like, don't, you better not do it. Don't <laughs> cut the carotids. Because it is it is so difficult for you guys. It just, it just makes it unbearable to try to embalm someone when there's already so much work. Right, exactly. Especially when you're going up the neck, cutting out the tongue and the throat and everything up there. It's really easy to accidentally snag the carotid. And if it's cut that high, it's so hard for us to get flow to the head. And that's like, that's the money maker. You really want a well embalmed head. So we'll do the same thing that we did before. We'll set our features, we'll inject and we'll do some massage. Um, setting features is the same, just no tongue. Um, you'll inject the head first. Time-wise, it makes the most sense, especially if you're just by yourself, to inject the head first, and you'll see why in a second. While you're massaging somebody in the injection portion, all of the blood that you're massaging just goes right into the cavity, and you use basically a modified aspirator to be able to suck it all out. If you're having a hard time reaching certain tissues, especially places that don't have a lot of good connections, so like the back tissues and things like that, there's a smaller trocar that you can use for injection. Uh, you can force the fluid right into the tissues and that really covers pretty much all of it for injection. Hmm. So something to keep in mind while you're doing this uh, injection portion of an autopsy embalming is exposure to chemicals. Instead of just having a simple one point uh, shooting fluid out down the drain, you now have an entire open body cavity that is full of blood and extra fluid that is just being pushed right into the air and fuming off. So you definitely want to try to get as much aspirated out as possible um, or take breaks every now and again to get away from the fumes. It's really important that we look out for ourselves when we're doing these kinds of things because you don't want to you know have your embalming career cut short because of cancer absolutely do you guys wear more protection when it comes to autopsy embalmings more ppe um so you should <laughs> um, that, that is uh not always the case especially with embalmers that have been doing it for a long time um, you can wear full face respirators um, that definitely help cut down on the fumes but even myself uh, will sometimes just wear a face mask and that's it. But don't follow what I do. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> and wearing an N95, that's what we do during the autopsies as well. So it's really better than nothing, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So it's time now that everything is firmed up and properly embalmed to sew everything back up. So once you completely dried out the interior of the body, you can place absorbent powders and embalming powders in there. You just kind of sprinkle them on, rub them like you would a rack of ribs, uh, for <laughs> lack of a better term. <laughs> it's really odd how many... Um, relations there are to food with embalming it's a lot yeah. of similarities it always comes up i don't know why <laughs> it really does um you'll stuff different cavities like uh, the butt parts uh, which is very medical um and then you'll roll a little bit of cotton to stick in the throat just to kind of replace what's missing since it's taken out um, then you replace the organ bag. Some people decide to suck out all of the fluids, including the cavity fluids, just so in case the bag is punctured, it doesn't start leaking out into the cavity. You'll tie it off real nice, and then you'll be able to place the rib plate back on top of that. Um, so the just so everyone is clear, the organs do go back inside the body. <laughs> it's yes, not like they're absolutely. disposed of. <laughs> Always, I mean, like think about it. What are we going to do with them? Like we don't, we don't want them. You guys can have them. No right. one's stealing your organs. I promise. <laughs> exactly. No one is black marketing your organs. It's okay. They're just going back in a different order, but they're still there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All of you is there for the most part. So. The really, really hard part that we have here coming up is getting the calvarium back in place in a very natural way. So you want to make sure that you use uh, essentially an embalmer's plumber's putty. You put that into the foramen magnum. You can put a little bit of embalming powder and absorbent powder in there. Um, you basically create a cotton brain to stick in there in place of where the brain normally would. You'll place the calvarium back on top of that, and you'll try to suture it all into place. That way it doesn't slip and you end up with a really weird wrinkle in your forehead because of it. Yeah, because the scalp skin is actually pretty thin, you can definitely tell if the skull cap is off-center. It's kind of like when you don't screw the lid of a jar on quite the right way. Yeah, exactly. It's got that little slip to it, so it's always best to try to make 
make sure you do it right the first time because God forbid you have to open up uh, ahead again just to fix that. So this is where you really, really want to have a second embalmer pal with you because now you have to sew up the entire head and sew up the entire body, the entire Y incision. And to do this by yourself is a pain in the butt. That's why I'd suggest earlier, if you are by yourself, do the head first because while other limbs are injecting, you can actually sew the head uh, while that's happening and then go and sew the Y incision afterwards. This part honestly takes like forever if you're by yourself. I'm serious. Like to, if anyone's hand stitched anything, imagine doing that to an entire um, abdomen while the organ bag is pushing back at you and you're trying not to stab a hole in it and the fumes are still coming out and it's just like, oh my God, what, <laughs> everything is happening at once. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to ask, so how long does it usually take you to just do the suturing part? If you're stuck doing back-to-back -back head and Y incision, honestly, this part could take even like 45 minutes just by itself because wow. you want to make sure the stitches in the head are just right where it'll have a really nice seal that won't leak but also doesn't look like a crazy Frankenstein accident. Right. Yeah, when we sew up the bodies at the medical examiner's office, we do a full stitch. So we don't just tack the corners. We do a full stitch. And honestly, it probably takes me like five minutes. Oh so my God. <laughs> <laughs> from there, you can see like the amount of detail that goes into it. Wow. I wish I had a five minute wide incision sewed <laughs> up. Oh man. <laughs> so to wrap up, if in case any of the tissues really didn't get the fluid, you tried all the other methods and it's still just soft. You don't want to leave that go because it could decompose and you really don't want that stink for visitation. So you can do what's called surface embalming. And um, what that is essentially, you can wrap the body part or whatever wasn't injected properly with cottons and then you can pour cavity fluid on that and essentially let it seep in through uh, the external uh, part of the skin and kind of get that surface embalming going. So it, it really helps a lot to be able to do that um, using other cotterants, things like that. So you cover that person up with plastic, that way the fumes aren't gassing off, and you just uh, let it cook <laughs> for a day or so. Right. And of course you do all the other things like covering them up with a sheet for respect and finishing your embalmer's report. I cannot state that enough. Finish your report. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, I don't know about you, Jim, but it's hard to cram a few hours of work into just a few minutes. I'm sure you mm. went through the same with your autopsy episode. Yep, that was a lot of information. Wowie. <laughs> but I really hope that I touched on a good majority of the basics to help people understand. Yeah, I think everyone knows how to do an embalming now. That being said, don't try this at home. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> But with difficult case embalmings come more specialized chemicals, accessory fluids, wise old embalmer tricks, and general black magic. <laughs> so there's definitely a bunch of stuff I had to leave out that is still used on the daily in your average prep room. Hopefully we can talk about some of that stuff in later episodes. Yeah, definitely. I'm really hoping that down the line, when there's a more relevant episode, I can give you more targeted embalming advice, like for cases of drowning, burn victims, children, and things like that. So definitely stay tuned to some future episodes. But that's it for this week on Mort Mike. We'd love to connect with you guys on our socials. Like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Mort Mike Podcast. That's M-O-R-T-M-I-C-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. It would mean so much to hear your guys' feedback. So please tell us what you think in a comment and drop us a rating on whatever podcast hosting site you use. If you have any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear about or burning questions you might have about death, shoot us an email at mortmikepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to give a huge thank you to our friend Marcin for the use of his song titled Deputies of Death, which he produced just for our show. You can check out his band camp at Marson, that's M-A-R-S-O-N, music.bandcamp.com. Thanks, Marson. Be sure to tune in every other week on Thursdays for more casual discussions on death. Thank you guys so much for listening. This has been Mort Mike. Bye. Bye. <laughs>